So today we're starting our new chapter, which is going to be all about cells, cell structure, cell function. We've talked about the chemical level, and so now we're moving into the cell level. So a little bit of quick history. Robert Hooke is given credit for coining the word cell. And what he did was he had made a microscope, a compound microscope, had two lenses, and he saw these hollow structures in cork. Now what he was really looking at, here's a picture of what he saw, he was looking at a slide of cork, which is dead cells, and so he was really only seeing the outer cell walls, but they remind him of the little room-like structures where the monks studied, and he called them cells because it reminded him of the rooms that the monks used, which were also called cells. And so the name sort of stuck. Uh, again, he really was only looking at the cell walls because the cells were dead. So really the other cell parts were kind of gone, dried out, but the cell walls were there. Now, after his time, another man, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, he actually looked at live cells. He looked at blood, rainwater, scrapings from people's teeth, and again, using a simple microscope. And he actually saw living cells. He called them animalcules because they look like little tiny animals. And then some other guys kind of pushed forward our discoveries. Matthias Schleiden, he basically uh, studied plants, and he looked at plant parts under the microscope and said that all plant parts were made of cells. And Theodore Schwann, notice, by the way, this is the 1800s. The earlier stuff was from the 1600s. So it took a long time. As the microscopes were getting better and better, they were able to see more and more. He basically looked at different kinds of animal cells um, and saw that pretty much all animal parts were made of cells as well. And finally, a guy by the name of Rudolf Virchow, he, uh, in 1855, said that all living cells came from other living cells. So he, he believed that cells came from other cells, that cell reproduction basically existed. And so from that, we've developed what we call cell theory. Cell theory basically says three things. One, all organisms are made of cells. Two, cells are the units of structure and function of living things, meaning we're not just made of them, but they are what keep us alive. They make up our structures. They carry out all of the functions. The reason you can think is brain cells. The reason you can move is nerve cells coordinating with muscle cells and bone cells, the skin cells protect us. So all of the, all the things we can do that keep us alive are because of our cells. And that all cells come from existing cells. And we'll study that later when we talk about cell reproduction. We'll talk about mitosis and meiosis and binary fission and different ways that cells make copies of themselves to pass on that information. So uh, we are also in this chapter going to talk a little bit about the microscope. We're going to do a lab with the microscope. And really, it, microscopes are so important because if it wasn't for microscopes, we wouldn't have even known about cells because they're too small to see with the naked eye. And so this picture kind of shows us a little bit about what we can see. If you remember micrometers, micrometers, it's the Greek letter mu, one micrometer is a millionth, 10 to the negative sixth of a meter. Or if you think of it this way, it's a thousand times smaller than a millimeter, which is the smallest little lines on a ruler. Very, very tiny. And you can see that most plant and animal cells are 10 to 100 micrometers in size, whereas bacterial cells are even smaller. They're only about one micrometer in size, depending on the type of bacteria. And viruses, which we don't consider alive, they're actually not made of cells, but they're even smaller. They're often measured in nanometers, which is a thousand times smaller than a micrometer. Um, and then molecules are even smaller than that. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a scale of, um, you know, cell sizes and why the microscope was so important. So compound light microscopes, just a quick overview of the microscope since we will be using it in the lab. It has two lenses. The eyepiece or ocular lens is what we look through. And then the objective lenses, oftentimes there's three or four of those and you can kind of turn and swap between them. And so they magnify, you. it magnifies twice. That's why it's called a compound microscope. The eyepiece usually magnifies about 10 times. These can ma uh, magnify 10, 4, 40, sometimes even 100 times. And your total magnification would be these numbers multiplied together. So, for example, if you're using the 10x objective and you're looking through the eyepiece, then your total magnification would be 100 times. Now, a great thing about the compound microscope that we use is that you can see living organisms. We can look at pond water. We may actually get to do that. 
and you'll actually see little organisms swimming around and they're not harmed by the microscope itself. Um, the light does get scattered though, it's called refraction, and as the light gets scattered, it kind of bends it, and ultimately it ends up distorting the image. And that's why with light microscopes, we can only magnify a maximum of about a thousand times. When you go much bigger than that, um, everything just gets blurry. It's sort of like if you've ever tried to focus on something with your phone, but you were too close and you just couldn't get it to come into focus no matter what you did. That's sort of what happens with these microscopes because of the way light gets scattered. We'll talk more about uh, microscopes another day, uh, but that's just kind of a little quick overview. Now, electron microscopes, they let us magnify a lot more. They have better what's called resolution, meaning you can tell the difference between two dots more easily. They don't blur together like they do, and that's because they use electrons, a beam of electrons, rather than light, so it doesn't get scattered the same way, and it allows us to see more detail. There's two different kinds of electron microscopes um, that you usually hear about. The transmission electron shows you like thin slices of cell parts, and the scanning electron gives you like a 3D surface image of the cell parts. And I have some pictures of both of these so you can see. So this is pollen under the scanning electron. See how it's very three-dimensional looking? This is a transmission electron picture of a cell. And notice how it's you're seeing like kind of through it, like a cross section. So they, they work a little different, um, but they both use electrons. They're both really big. If you look at the pictures, the electron microscopes are very large. The specimens require a lot of preparation and they're really expensive, probably $100,000 or more. Whereas the light microscopes um, are like 400 to maybe $2,000, which is still a lot of money, but definitely a lot cheaper than electron microscopes. Now, why are cells so small? And here's the answer. As cells get bigger, the surface area increases faster than the volume. Now, you've got to remember what these things are, surface area and volume, because most of you have heard of them, but you don't really think it through. So the surface area is the exposed surface. If something needed to get to the middle of this, this cell, it's got to get it can only get in from where there's exposed membrane, right? That means it's got to travel a pretty far distance to get to the middle. But if you took a cell that was, if you took the same volume, the same amount of material, but split it into a bunch of little cells, notice now all of this surface area, these are all areas where stuff can get to the middle. And so stuff can get to the middle faster. And so as one single cell gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens is there becomes too much volume inside and not enough surface area. Bottom line, stuff can only travel so fast and it can't get to the center fast enough to keep the cell alive. And therefore cells stay small. Cells that are bigger, like muscle cells and nerve cells, tend to be long and skinny. Even cell parts that are large are long and skinny. Why? Because if I take this amount, say this was jello when I pour it into this mold, and I took another set of jello when I poured it into this mold that was a cube, these might weigh the exact same amount. They might have the same amount of gelatin. But this one, stuff could get to the middle of it really fast, right? If I drop this in to dye, the dye would get to the middle pretty quick. Here, the dye would be much slower. So um, that is why cells, if they are going to be larger, they tend to be long and skinny versus big giant cubes or big giant spheres. All right, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, eukaryotes do. Prokaryotes are small. In fact, they're about one to 10 micrometers, whereas eukaryotic cells are usually 10 to 100 micrometers, so much bigger. Prokaryotes are bacteria. Eukaryotes are all the other kingdoms, plant, animal, fungus, Reproduction is asexual in prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells, sometimes it's also asexual, um, although that's called mitosis, and it's a different kind of thing than binary fission, which is the way that it is in bacteria. Um, it's just a much simpler process. This happens in about 20 minutes. This takes about 13 hours, so obviously this must be a bit more complicated. And then the only organelles in prokaryotic cells are ribosomes. But in eukaryotic cells, there's lots of different organelles. It's going to be the rough and smooth ER and the Golgi bodies and vacuoles, mitochondria, chloroplasts. And we're going to go through all of them. All cells have certain things in common. They all have a cell membrane. They all have DNA. All cells have ribosomes. And all cells have cytosol or cytoplasm. Here's a picture that kind of illustrates the difference. So prokaryotes, very small. 
eukaryotes, much bigger. And then you have all these cell parts inside. Notice the nucleus. This is just the DNA in an area that's called the nucleoid. You do see ribosomes, but no other cell parts. So let's get a little bit into eukaryotic cell parts. We're not going to get through all of them today. The cell membrane is made of a phospholipid bilayer. It has proteins inside of it, stuck in it. The phospholipids look like this. They're like a ball with two sticks coming off. They have a hydrophilic, meaning water-loving, head. That's these circles. And then the tails are hydrophobic. They don't like water, which is why this is like magnified off of, if you imagine this is the cell membrane here, which is why the tails face each other, because they don't want to touch the watery environment inside the cell here or outside the cell here. So by facing each other and being lined with these phosphates, these parts like water, and so... This forms what we call a selectively permeable or a semi-permeable barrier that can control what enters and leaves. There's proteins stuck in it. They do all kinds of jobs. One of the things they do is they form like channels or tunnels that let things in and out. They can also be ID markers. Um, they can also be receptors to pick up information. So there's uh, several different jobs that they can do. So here's a section of the cell membrane. You can see the phospholipids here. So these are the hydrophobic uh, tails here that don't like water. And then these are the heads that do like water. And see how the hydrophilic parts face the cytoplasm inside and face the outside as well. And then these are the proteins, which have a bunch of different jobs. But one of the ones that would be important to know um, next chapter, we'll get more into this, is they can be channels. They can carry things in. So some things get bumped off here. They can't get into the cell this way, but they can pass through these protein channels. All right, the nucleus, it contains the DNA, which is the instructions to build proteins. And it has a nuclear membrane, or it's sometimes called a nuclear envelope, and it's got a bunch of pores in it, which are little holes, which let certain things pass in and out of the nucleus. Inside is what's called chromatin, which is basically DNA, but it's, it's DNA associated with proteins. Bacteria actually don't have chromatin, they just have the DNA. And then there's an area in the nucleus, you see it in this little animation, and it's here. This is the area they're talking about. It's called the nucleolus, and it makes something called rRNA, which is what the ribosomes are composed of. So this is, a, this is not a cell, this is a nucleus. This area is the nucleolus. All this stuff you're seeing here would be the chromatin, um, which would then contain the DNA. This picture kind of illustrates it. So here's your nucleus. These are your pores. This is what it looks like under a scanning electron microscope, that 3D image. Um, these are the pores under the transmission electron microscope. And this is chromatin. This is Your DNA would be this blue string. And these proteins are called histones, and the, the chromatin is sort of organized and wrapped around those. Now, there's a whole bunch of organelles. They're all found in a jelly-like material called cytoplasm. Sometimes called cytoplasm, uh, cytosol. Organelle means little organs because they are like little organs. They're tiny cell parts that do all kinds of different jobs for the cell. So the first one we'll talk about is the ribosome. Ribosomes look like little dots. They're made of protein as well as RNA, which is kind of like DNA. Um, their job is to make protein. That's what they do. They build proteins all day, all the time. The DNA of your cell is the instructions that tell the ribosomes what proteins to make. Some of them are floating around in the cytoplasm, like little dots. And then other ribosomes are found around the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So you see the dots on this that makes it look all bumpy. Those are rough uh, ribosomes around the rough ER. Now, talking about the ER, the ER forms an internal membrane system. And if you look, there's two kinds, rough ER and smooth ER. So the rough ER, it modifies proteins that the ribosomes make. So remember, ribosomes can be found around this, and then the protein will go inside these sacs, and it can get modified, like it can have lipids added to it, or it can get folded into specific shapes, kind of finishing touches if you think about it, like editing an essay after you have your rough draft. And then the smooth ER, it makes lipids. It also can detoxify drugs. Um, it can also be associated with carbohydrates as well. So we're going to stop there, and we'll do the remainder of the cell parts in our next lecture.